So something important for me since starting the show is sharing things and topics that are relatable about what people are going through, whether that's myself or somebody I know, or the vast majority of Americans, you know, when it comes to education or when it comes to what's going on within the home or just the abortion industry as a whole and what's happening there. I want to talk about things that are relevant to families and to children and obviously the sanctity of life and something that I think is important to share are the stories of women who have had abortions. I want to give a heads up that today's episode is about a woman who's had an abortion. She comes on to share her testimony. When I have had people reach out to me, I've had a lot of them say I have had an abortion in my past. And so I want to acknowledge them and give them material that is going to be relatable to them and on their journey for healing, really. And then for people who you know may just stumble on the show and say, oh, wow, I didn't know this. I have more grace for women who have been in these shoes or I am maybe have had an abortion myself and this is something that I need to hear and is going to get me on my path uh, to healing. So I asked my friend, dear, dear friend, Tony McFadden to come on and she said that she would. She has a very powerful testimony, but I want you to be cognizant of who is in the room because yes, this is all true and it's all facts, but you know, some things are age appropriate for, um, children and preteens. And then some things are not, I will let you guys be the judge of what you think you're uh, children, preteens, teens, whatever can listen to if you are somebody who has children. Um, if you're somebody else who is post-abortive, I would caution you to know that if you have not gone through healing yet, this may be an episode that is pretty tough to hear, but I still think it's one that is worth hearing. So uh, without further ado, Tony is an international speaker on the topic of abortion and healthy relationships. She is the founder of the program Relationships Matter, which seeks to educate the youth on the degradation of sex in our culture while equipping them to walk out healthy relationships to not only protect themselves, but to honor their spouse in the future. Tony knows the power of overcoming her own past and setting a new foundation for herself. Her goal is to educate and expose the lies of abortion by sharing her own personal story of having an abortion herself. Tony also works as a counselor, counseling women in unplanned pregnancies. And like I said, she is very vulnerable in this episode. So be cognizant of who is around and uh, welcome back to Speak Out with Christine Jurgen. Well, Tony, thank you so much for joining today. I'm so excited to have you. This is really special because you're my friend outside of this as well. So I'm glad to have you on, catch up a little bit, and um, be able to let everybody who listens to this hear your story because you have such a powerful one and have been doing such amazing things for the pro-life movement. Thank you. It's so exciting to see you and to be able to share. So I'm excited. Okay. So... We've been friends for a while and I've heard your story. I've met you, you know, just from working in the pro-life movement and whatnot, but you have a story that's really powerful. I share mine often and my story is different in yours that, um, you know, I had an unplanned pregnancy. Um, I ended up choosing life, but I've always thought like in telling my story sometimes that the women who have had abortions and share it have almost even more powerful impact. And I think that you can reach women that I can't, you know, they're like, yeah, yeah, you know, you did this, you chose life, whatever, good for you. You had a success story, but not everybody has that, but you have a totally different perspective in that I chose this and I want to share about it so that you know the truth of what it is, regardless of what you choose. Now you right. have the truth. So I want to have you on and one of my followers to hear from you. Let's start from the beginning okay. with your story and kind of just tell us everything. Yeah. Well, I faced my own unplanned pregnancy my senior year in high school, which that is just difficult in itself because there is a vision of what your senior year is going to look like. You know, all this fun, you know, senior prom and graduating and starting, you know, this whole new chapter of your life. And I grew up in a home that there's lots of kids. So I was kind of in the middle of all that. And I say all this 
because I was known as like the good one in my family. Like, well, we don't have to worry about her. You know, I was always involved in sports and musicals and all this stuff. And so me facing an unplanned pregnancy would be totally out of the norm for anything my family would think would happen for me. So I had been dating a guy off and on for about two years and hindsight, it was never the greatest relationship at all. But um, when he found out I was pregnant, the first thing he said to me was, you don't want to keep it, do you? And I remember telling my best friend and she was just like, you cannot keep this baby. So I tell people that these are the only two voices that I heard. What were your thoughts when you saw, you know, I don't know exactly. Did you see the two pink lines on a pregnancy test? Like what went through your head of, you know, you're saying what other people thought people didn't realize that I would be that type of person because I was the good one. And here's what my friend said, but what did Tony think when she saw the pregnancy test turn out positive? Well, I had stolen the pregnancy test from where I was working. I was working at CBS at the time. (laughs) And during my lunch break, I went into the bathroom and, you know, took the test. First one was positive. I took the second set because obviously you go right into denial. Like, no, this is not happening. And so I took the second one positive. And I just remember having almost like an outer out of body experience This could not be happening. I can't tell my parents. What am I going to do? Fear is filling my my whole body. I remember going to my boss and just saying I felt sick and that I needed to go home. I could not function. And everything became like a blur to me because not that I didn't know how you can get pregnant, but you don't think it's going to happen to you. Yep. And I was looking to my boyfriend and my best friend to be support for me because I didn't know who else to go to. And I just remember this whole, from the time my, my friend helped me and call the abortion facility, just, and being in a, a haze, like I'm walking around my house. I have this deep, dark secret and my parents have no idea what's going on. I remember walking through the hallways at school and just thinking, I'm going through a crisis and I have no one to go to and I just want to get this over with so my my life could just go back to normal. Now, I was a journaler, so I used to journal a lot and um, I remember writing to God and even saying, I know this is a baby, but I didn't feel like I had any other option. So I didn't even know what pregnancy resource centers were. I only knew a Planned Parenthood that, I mean, I didn't even know pregnancy resource centers um, existed. So my best friend basically did everything for me. She called the place and now I'm aging myself here. We didn't have cell phones (laughs) this time. Okay. We have the ones that do this. (laughs) Is that what we're doing? The the spin around? (laughs) Yeah, landline. So um, I remember the abortion facility calling me and telling me they were going to give me a new name. What? Yeah. Okay, so So, wait, your friend called and then the abortion, this is a Planned Parenthood, right? Mm -hmm. And they call you? Yeah. So they're like tracking you down. They're like, we want your money, come to us. Right. But the kicker is the reason they were telling me they were going to give me a new name was because when they had to call me to remind me of my appointment, they wanted to make sure that if my parents answered, they wouldn't find out. Wow. Yeah. So they've always been deceptive. Totally you know? deceptive. But as a teenager, I'm thinking, oh, they're helping me right. through this situation. And I just remember walking um, or driving there. My best friend drove and my boyfriend came along <clears throat> to pay half of for, of the abortion. Mm. So I remember going there and feeling so out of place. As 
fast as I walked in there, I wanted to walk out, but I felt stuck. And I'll never forget my boyfriend sitting across from me in this tiny little waiting room. There were too many girls to be in there in the first place. And some of them were way farther along than I was. And I was, excuse me, I was so uneducated. I knew nothing about fetal development. I knew none of that. I just knew I want my life to go back to normal. That's all I was thinking. I don't want my parents to find out about this. And I remember my boyfriend sitting across from me. My legs are constantly shaking because I've never been in this type of setting before. And I remember the nurse calls my name and I get up and I think my boyfriend's going to get up with me. And he just sits there. Stop. And looks at the ground. Mm. And my best friend gets up with me and the nurse walks me in the back. Now, I didn't get any counseling. Like I know some people get counseling beforehand to make sure. So they didn't say anything to you? No, I went in with the nurse to get an ultrasound. And the screen was faced against the wall. It was like this tiny little screen, not those big, nice screens you see in the PRCs. (laughs) Right, right. They actually want you to see your baby. Um, I just remember laying on the table and I never got an ultrasound before. Like I didn't know what was going on at all. And I remember asking the nurse if I could see the screen and she, her whole tone changed. Like her, like the way she whipped around to look at me was scary. Like her whole demeanor just changed. And she's like, you really shouldn't see that. And, you know, she tried to discourage you. Yeah. Because it was faced against the wall on purpose. They, because they don't want you to see it. And I'm thinking I'm a child still. And I'm looking to you as an adult to tell me like, everything's okay. That what I'm doing is okay. Really? Or do you know what your options are? The fact that they didn't even tell you your options of, you know, hey, do your parents know? Hey, what, what, how can we help you? What is it that you want? How do you feel about this? They just take you in, don't even want to show you the ultrasound. And then what? Well, she reluctantly turned the screen around. And obviously with the naked eye, I'm just seeing a little circle, you know, I'm not seeing much, but she says to me, see, it's nothing. It's just the size of the P. Wow. So when you, for context here, for maybe somebody who's never been pregnant, when you go get an ultrasound, um, you know, it is very small in the very beginning, but usually you can see a heartbeat and they'll, they'll, they explain it to you. I mean, if you haven't been trained on how to do ultrasound or what to see, A lot of times, unless, you know, it is a very big visible baby and they're showing you a part of the baby that you can, you know, recognize like a hand or something like that, which they can do. But other times if they're looking at different things, you don't know what they're looking at. It looks like a bunch of gibberish. And when they're smaller, they kind of have to explain it and walk you through it. You know, here's, this is your uterine lining. This is the placenta. This is the baby. You know, this is the heartbeat. Can you see it beating? And they let you hear the heartbeat as well. Did you get to hear the heartbeat? Well, here's the thing. I was seven weeks along. And she didn't tell me that my baby already had a heartbeat. Wow. So, Christine, we, you and I know that at the moment of conception, my baby already had its own unique DNA. Yeah. Of course, she didn't want to tell me that part or that that DNA is the blueprint for my child's life. You know, that tells you everything about them, you know, their eye color and how tall they're going to be, boy, girl, you know, all of that. And they purposely leave out that information because the goal of the ultrasound was not to inform me. It was to inform them how far along I was. So I knew, so they knew how much to charge me for the abortion. That was the whole goal. That's it. And I've learned that they have scripts on what to say when our girl is maybe second guessing or doesn't, or is going to change her mind. Okay. This part, I don't know if I even knew this part. Oh yeah. Yeah. I've talked to Abby Johnson about that. Like they have scripts on what to say. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. You know, cause their whole goal is not to help me. Their whole goal is financial gain. And 
I, if only, if only I knew then what I know now, I probably would have made a different decision. But that's the hard thing about abortion is you can't go back and change it. It's permanent. And I was given the RU-46 bill, the chemical abortion bill that is being pushed all over the place now that you can go and get at CBS, Walgreens, Rite Aid, where I had to go in and get an ultrasound to make sure I was pregnant and also to, you know, so they knew how much to charge me. But I'm having to go see the abortionist to explain what these pills are going to do. Now, obviously, he didn't explain it to me in a way that would truly inform me. He handed me a little Dixie cup of juice, put two pills in there and said, drink this and this will stop the pregnancy. Okay, so the nurse didn't tell you anything, didn't tell you how far along you are really or explain the ultrasound. The abortionist, did the abortionist say anything? Or was there anything beyond that? Any explanation, any, you know, additional informed consent? Any, are you sure you want to do this? No, none you of that. You just have two people not telling you anything. How pro-woman of them. Yeah, you know, and I felt like it was just a lot of distraction. Like he was asking me questions like, oh, you know, where, where do you go to school? What do you, what do you want to be when you grow up? And this is normal. A lot of women do this. Like, it was a lot of that. It wasn't, are you sure you want to do this? You look scared. I had never had a pelvic exam before. And that was my first one there. So I had no clue what, and here's this man doing all of this. Yeah. That's totally scary when you've never had it was that done. So you're scary. like, what is happening? Yeah. It was so scary. And, but I felt, what's the word? I was like, I couldn't move. Like, I just, I felt like I have to do whatever they tell me to do. And I didn't want to ask any more questions. I just wanted to get out of there. And I drank the juice with the pills and I didn't realize then that it blocked the hormone progesterone and this basically starved my baby to death because they don't explain it like that, that that's what those pills do. Um, that caused my baby to detach from my uterus and then it would no longer receive blood flow or nutrients for me to grow. Praise God that we had the abortion pill reversal, but that was not around during the time that I took these pills. And so they gave this 18 year old girl some more poisonous pills to take home with her. And they said in 24 or 48 hours, take this, these sets of pills. And they gave me two sets of them. And they said, um, this will expel the pregnancy and it'll just be like a heavy period. Mm. And that is not what happened for me. Um, Let me not forget, my boyfriend actually broke up with me the day after um, him and my best friend had brought me to the abortion clinic. And I just remember when I left there, I kind of knew it was going to happen. Like, I felt it, but I thought, if I do this, my parents won't find out and maybe I could save my relationship. Because he was in college at this point, because he was a year ahead of me in school. So I was a senior. He had already gone to college. And I remember when we left that place, laying in the back seat, and I'm just bawling my eyes out because I couldn't articulate it then, but it changes you when you take the life of your own flesh and blood. Yeah. And that's something the abortion industry cannot prepare you for. You know, they paint it as if it's normal and it's natural, but there's nothing natural about that. And there's something not only physically, but spiritually that breaks in you when you're willing to sacrifice your own for your own benefit. And you don't realize the, um, the traumatic effect it's going to have for you, on you in years to come. You know, you think it's a quick fix and it's not. So it, the ripple effect happened where, you know, he breaks up with me, not get, not answering any of my calls. I was trying to call him, let him know that that weekend I was going to take the pills 
and just for him like support and he would not answer my phone call. So it wasn't like he was man enough to say, Hey, I got to get out of this relationship. I'm going to break up with you. It was just like, he just ghosted you. Yeah. Well, we didn't have that term back then. (laughs) (laughs) We know what it is now. Right. Um, Yeah. Totally ghosted me. And so just imagine I'm about to graduate in like three, three and a half months. I just had this abortion. Boyfriend's boyfriend broke out with me. My parents think everything's normal. And I take these pills at my best friend's house and nothing happens. And I'm like, okay, you know? And so So this is the second set of pills within the 24 to 48 hours. Yes. And I called them to let them know because I'm honestly, I was so ignorant and so uneducated. I had no idea what the heck I was doing. And I just, how are you supposed to know if they don't educate you? I know I'm blaming myself for that, but you know, I was just like, I thought I did what I was supposed to do, you know, and I just remember how mean they were to me on the phone. When I called, they were just like, well, this is why we gave you two sets. Just take the second set and you'll be fine. And just hung up, like didn't let me ask any more questions. Just wow. And so I took the second set and I spotted a little bit. Now, here's my here's where my ignorance comes in and their lack of education. I remember the nurse saying to me that the baby was just the size of a pea and it was nothing. So I thought, oh, well, maybe that's it. A month and a half about or so, I'm in school and I'll never forget it. I'm in chorus. And all of a sudden- Wait, a month and a half later? Yeah. It was about a month, month and a half after I had taken these pills. Now, granted, I realized, and this is my BTMI- I realized I wasn't able to really use tampons and I just thought it was because of that, that maybe I had to give it time or whatever. But I start feeling these excruciating pains. It was like lightning bolts throughout my whole body just came on out of nowhere. And I remember having a friend help me to walk to the nurse's office. Like I literally could not walk on my own. I was in so much pain. And I walk into the nurse's bathroom because I felt all this pressure. And this is a little graphic just to warn viewers. Um, But I go to the bathroom and there are blood clots, literally the size of my fist, just leaving my body. And I'm like in shock. And... I don't, I want to tell the nurse, but then I'm like, I don't, I'm too scared to tell them. And I'm realizing, was this was what was supposed to happen before? And I didn't even know what to do. I put a pad on and it just soaks right through it right away. And I'm, I'm like, I got to call my mom. I got to go home. And my poor mom has no clue what the heck is going on. I don't even tell her. And I'm just like, oh, I have bad cramps. I could literally have a pad on for like 20 minutes and it'd be done. And I went into, I went home and I will never forget going from my bedroom to the bathroom for hours. And I'm just bleeding and bleeding. And are you still in pain at this point? Yeah. Extreme pain. And for some reason I can't get beyond that day, I just remember laying in fetal position in my bed and just hoping I wasn't going to die, honestly. I I mean, that's as far as my mind can go from that. And I don't think it just lasted that night. I think it was a few days, but I just can't. I think it was so traumatic that that's as far that I can think about it. Um, but that's what I mean by no one prepares you for that. And everyone thinks, oh, it's just pills and it's quick. Like, I think this is even more traumatic in a sense for a first trimester abortion because it's, it was, I put the pills in my mouth. Like I drank it. I did the, like I 
did it myself. It wasn't like I was sedated and an abortionist did the abortion. So psychologically, the effects of it is a little bit different um, because it was my choice, literally, to do that. Um, but two words that I love are, but God, <laughs> because yeah. I would not be sitting here sharing my story with you today if it wasn't for the grace of God. And what you said earlier about your story compared to mine is only by the grace of God. I would love to have your story. Like, I love when I hear yeah. women that someone intervened and don't be, do not be ashamed of that. If you chose life for your baby and your story is different, praise the Lord. I would never, ever, ever want someone to be on the side of pain that I've had to endure because of my poor choices of being selfish. You chose what was selfless. And now you get to look at your miracle every single day. Don't ever be ashamed of that. The only reason shame has been lifted from me because there should be shame in abortion. There should be because it is a shameful act. It's barbaric. It, it's selfish. And I had to come to grips with that. And that's why I can say what I'm saying now, because it's only because of the Lord that my shame has been lifted. No one else is going to lift that for you. Um, you could be sorry about it, but until someone takes that and says, I'm going to replace it with myself, which can only come from God, you're not going to heal the way that you need to to heal. And the healing process isn't easy because you have to actually look at the act that you did and say, I killed my own child. It's still not easy for me to say that, but I know that my mission is to help women never to go through this. This is why I'm vulnerable with sharing my story like this, because if I could spare women from the lies, this this it's worth it for me. And I believe every time I share this, my child actually has a voice mm-hmm. that his voice, and I'm saying his, which you can read my book about it <laughs> if you yes. want to know all the details about that because we don't have time. But I know I had a boy. And I believe that the Lord is using his voice to protect other babies, to help women heal that have been in my place as well, um, that condemnation can be lifted. And so um, this is why I'm so thankful for platforms like yours to help women who have walked in my shoes to know that this doesn't always have to be your identity that um, you don't have to carry that burden forever, that if you give your life over to God, that you can be set free. But let me be honest, the regret is never going to leave. Yeah. Um, Well, this is why I wanted to have you on because I've, you know, I've shared my story and I've given speeches about my story and talked to college campuses or pregnancy centers or, you know, done podcast episodes. But I always hear from people like, Oh, well, good for you, but what about, or can you, can you share, or even friends that I have who've had abortions and who are like, I'd love to hear from somebody who's had an abortion or, um, you know, I, I know lots of people who've been affected in this way. Maybe it's a grandparent who struggles yeah. with the fact that their child had one. Maybe it's, um, a sibling who struggles with the fact that their sibling had one and they weren't able to be yeah. there with them. There's a lot of different instances where I hear from people who are like, well, I want to hear from somebody who's had one. Can you share that perspective as well? Which is why I thought you were the perfect person to have because you are willing to be so vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And even people who have had them, who are pro-life, who do share, not a lot of them will go into that detail of, hey, I'm going to tell you exactly what it is. And you're right. There is forgiveness and there is grace and there is redemption and all of this is through God and there is healing. So I kind of want to jump into that a little bit in case somebody listening has had one or knows somebody who's had one so they know that they can have those resources because you work with a lot of these women now, right? So tell us a little bit about that aspect of things. We can, you know, kind of jump back and forth through the story too. But, you know, for anybody listening, I really want them to have these resources. I had an abortion. I'm hurting. Now what? Right. Well, I love Students for Life of America. I've partnered with you guys so much and I love standing with you 
you have resources that, you know, women who get pregnant on their college campuses and they don't know what to do. Students for Life will help you. They're yep. standing with standing with you. They will help you. And I love um, that resource. I love Embrace Grace um, helping women because, you know, in the pro-life movement, we get told that we are pro-birth and that's it, which right. is a complete lie. Right. Um, I work with um, Loveline, which is Abby Johnson's organization, Pro Love Ministries. And so I'm counseling women right now who have chosen life for their babies and who may have had past abortions. And so I'm getting to walk alongside them and um, be able to help them to heal through this process. I use a Bible study called Forgiven and Set Free by Linda Cochran, which you can get on Amazon. Um, that's a great, great resource. There's also, um, what's it called? It's, I'm losing the name right now. Um, Rachel's Vineyard, mm -hmm. where you can actually have um, a memorial service for your baby. I did that, um, not with Rachel's Vineyard, but when I walked through um, my healing, I had a memorial service for my baby and it was just so healing, so healing to name my child and to be able to say your life did matter and um, to walk through that healing was um, an amazing process to go through. You know, there's probably so many that we don't even know of, right. but off the top of my head, yes, I, I think the Rachel's Vineyard is a big one. Mm -hmm. Support after abortion is another one. Right. Um, I think there's one called If Not For Grace, um, I've never if heard. I recall. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can link some in the footnotes so that yeah. people, so you guys, when you're listening, you can have access to all of these mm -hmm. and we'll be able to find some. But when it comes to that, when you're walking through this with these women, you know, mm -hmm. some who are choosing life, obviously, but maybe have had past abortions, like, what do you, what do you tell them? What, do, maybe what is like a little glimpse of these devotionals that you're doing with them and, you know, how you're counseling them? Well, a lot of it comes down to um of the reality and that's hard like i said in before the reality of what actually happened not using euphemisms yeah and you cannot go through that on your own so number one i'm sharing with them i am your support system you need people who are going to be praying or around you during this time because i'm not going to sugarcoat it this healing process is not easy. It's trauma. I mean, it's some women have PTSD from it. Like right. They can't even hear a baby cry and it oh, triggers wow. them. Yeah, There have been women who have come to me who've had an abortion like 20, 25 years ago, never told anyone. And just the fact that they have a safe place to be able to say it for the first time, you can hear it in their voices, the healing starting to take place just because they were able to verbalize it in a safe place for them. So people saying these lies that abortion doesn't affect women. Oh, it might affect some. No, I see it time and time and time again. And they believe those lies too. Like, oh, I thought it wasn't affecting me. And then 10 years later, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, something comes up or they're pregnant for the first time mm. and they're keeping this baby and they're like, oh, this was the process I should have gone through. Yeah. Well, or I think sometimes too, what I would say is like a lot of times they have things going on in their life that they may not even realize the abortion is affecting them yes. because it's manifesting in a way that they weren't told that could be something you know, potential. I know like uh, sleep deprivation. I know um, mental health issues, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, suicidal thoughts, all yes. of these things. You might start drinking and you don't even realize it's to dull the me. pain or you don't even know what, like why mm -hmm. you're start picking up an alcohol problem or a drug yeah. problem or something like that. So I think sometimes they do have those initial issues after abortion, they just may not be able to connect it. Or like you said, maybe, maybe they don't regret it right away. Maybe they have instant yeah. relief because oof, that problem is mm -hmm. gone. Right. But then the more you think about it, you know, life is long. If you have an abortion at 20 years old yeah, or 30 years old, you have decades more right. to live, you know, right. God willing. And 
just because you don't regret regret it in year one, two, or three, doesn't mean that you're not going to regret it, which is why I can't stand those studies that are out there that say, you know, people don't regret their abortions or nobody regrets them. (laughs) Life is long. Did you ask them when they were 40 years old, 50 years old, 60, you know, did you continue to follow up with them? Like in what way, shape or form was this study done like right. thoroughly to actually exactly. know if women do regret abortion in their lifetime. Um, so when you had yours, mm-hmm. like the days after, were you feeling immediate regret? Were you um, kind of just glad that it was over and done with? Obviously your boyfriend had disappeared. You're probably sad there too. How yeah. did like it affect you mentally and emotionally in the days and weeks after you had the abortion? Well, I had regret right after I left the abortion clinic, but then lies are tricky because I was just kind of lying to myself. I was in denial. You know, the I, you probably have heard like the five stages of grief. I was in the denial stage for a long time. So I basically kind of just... After it all happened, after, you know, it was fully done, I think I just stuffed it down and started looking at positive things that were happening. Like, okay, I'm about to graduate. I was in like course and stuff and I was doing a lot of fun things that on the surface that kept me distracted. Right. You know, but it's funny. Well, it's not funny. Funny is not the right word. Um, I thought if I have the abortion, then... I would go off to college. I didn't go off to college right away. Mm. I went downhill pretty quickly. Um, As you mentioned with the drinking, I started partying a lot more and I was in such meaningless relationships. And before that, he was my, my ex was my only relationship I'd really been in. And all of a sudden, you know, the whole hookup culture, that's basically what I was kind of doing um, for about a year or so. And then I finally did go to college for a little bit. And then I transferred out to a college further from my, from my town. Cause I was just like, I got to get out of here. And that was God's grace for me. I think he did that for me, not knowing what was on the other side. And that's when I became a Christian was when I started going to this other college and went to a Campus Crusade for Christ meeting and that changed the trajectory of my entire life, um, my college experience, all of that. And that was a huge turnaround for me um, of being put on a path of not knowing that I would be speaking about my abortion though. But it was the first step when I gave my heart to the Lord that I was created for something bigger. And I don't know what the purpose is, but the more I got to know Jesus, the more he helped me to be vulnerable like I am now. Because when you're vulnerable, it helps other people to be vulnerable. And I realized I don't have anything to give. So anything good that you're hearing or seeing me do is not because of me. It's because of him. It's because this is the path that he's called me on. I can't take any credit for it. I'm like, my life would not look like this if God had not intervened in my life. So I, I'm just thankful that um, I've seen so many women healed because I've been vulnerable and, Mm -hmm. you know, they're out there, oh, shout your abortion. It's so, and I'm not saying this because it's a coincidence. It's so dead sounding. Like it's just empty. And the only reason they're saying that is because they want to justify their actions. It's easier to try to justify those actions than to be humble and admit it was a wrong. It's a lot harder to do that. And so these women, I've gone to the women's marches like you have. I've seen them yelling and screaming and oh, acting a fool. They're and- a whole different breed. I mean, but you know what I always say is like, when you're there, you're like, oh my gosh, this is so gross. You guys, it's repulsive. You, it it, it's like demonic. It's, mm-hmm. But at the same time, you can almost look in their eyes and feel sorry for them. You know, feel like, I know why you're lashing out. 
I know why you're acting this vulgar. I know what you've been through. And does that make what you're saying to me right? Or the way you're behaving right? Absolutely Mm -hmm. not. Right. But it kind of puts it in perspective in a way that you can digest it a little bit easier. Like, no, their behavior is not acceptable, Mm -hmm. but I know why they're acting that way. And uh, on the same way for myself, when I look at them, I was you. I may not have acted outwardly like they are. Yeah. But there's really no difference because I ended my child's life too. So I can't look at them in the same way of someone who's never had an abortion. I right. I can't. How arrogant for me to ever look at someone who's had an abortion with disdain <laughs> when I I know what it's like to be in that place. So I have a different mentality when I look at them. Yes, some of them are demonic. Some of them are on a whole other level that I'm like, "Eh, I don't even can't put that in a category. But there's some who you can see the spiritual struggle that you can see it. And you do feel like your heart breaks. And that's when you try to get one on one with some of them, you know, instead of in the group setting. But um. I hope that more women share their stories like this. And, but I also hope there are less women like myself who have these types of stories because there's so much information out there now. There's so much more education at, out there right now. And we have this that yeah. can give us so a computer. Much for, if you're listening and you're not watching, she's holding up a phone. We literally have a computer in yeah. our pockets or in our purse yeah. at all times. Yeah. And so that's the beauty of um, being able to, you can educate yourself. If you're ever in this situation, I would say, I, what I wish someone would have told me was, I know this is difficult. I know you don't know what the future holds, but choosing life will always be worth it. Because if I could go back, I would give my life, I would give my child life in a heartbeat. I would go back and change that, um, but I can't. And so for those of you who are, who may be listening or know someone, have compassion on the person. And the way you can have compassion is to actually think about what it would be like to be in their shoes, not above them or like, I would never do that. Or what would it be like if you were in their shoes? What would you be afraid of? And trying to eliminate those fears for her. Because that's what I'm doing when I when a girl comes to me and she's like, I don't have finances. I don't have this. I don't. We're going to help you provide these things for you. Because a lot of times it is financial for why they want to abort. Right. And you, we can provide those things for her. You and I do this all the time. We throw these baby showers yeah. online and people are so generous to buy everything on their registry. We see it time and time. I'm always shocked every time. I don't know why. (laughs) I'm shocked that people will buy up everything so quickly. And um, so I love being a part of this movement. I I love being on this side of things. And I have hope that others will come on this side too and um, promote life. And so lastly, though, I just wanted to share with your viewers the most powerful, one of the powerful things of my story is that um, almost 10 years later, the same guy had the abortion with, which I'm sure a lot of you are mad at, which you should be. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But uh, he actually gave me a huge gift. And that was he offered forgiveness and asked me for forgiveness for um, the way he left the relationship. And I never thought I would ever see him again in my entire life, but he came up out of the blue. He had been looking for me for about two years. Um, The Lord actually had saved him. And I was one person that he had put on his heart that he needed to reconcile. And he thought I was going to be married and everything already. So it was a little awkward for him. Yeah. But it was a very manly thing for him to do because he did not say this to me over the phone. He was very adamant about meeting me face to face. And I will never forget him telling me that um, he left the relationship because he, as a man, didn't want to have to face the fact that we ended the life of our own child. 
And in that moment, I realized that abortion affects men too. Yeah. And, and we he was what, just 19, it. right? Because he was 18, He was 19? actually younger. He's younger than me. He graduated when he was 17. So he was like 17. So even at 17, it affected him yeah. as a man saying, like thinking, I just ended the life of my yeah, child. Yeah. And so, it, it's so much so that he felt the need to just kind just of run, disappear. Just yeah. disappear and run. It was too heavy for him. And now that the Lord had grabbed his heart, he realized that, you know, I didn't protect you and I didn't protect our child because that's what real men do. They protect. And uh, long story short, less than a year later, I actually married him. So <laughs> I always get goosebumps every time I hear this. I love it so much. <laughs> it's just the best. And because God's the best and yeah. we serve a redemptive God and uh, we have four children and really five, but um, we were able to honor our baby at our wedding. And that was a huge oh. uh, blessing to be able to acknowledge their life at the candlelight part of our ceremony and um, to represent their life and then to have four children, two girls and two boys, we know what our child probably would have looked like, you know, right, and right. Um, just to see God's grace and his timing and um, he didn't have to do that. God did not have to do that, but that's the kind of God we serve. And so this is why I will never, ever share my story without giving glory to God because he writes the best stories. And I would be remiss to think that a woman could heal without him. I would not be yeah. telling, being honest, if I just say, oh, if you do these things, then, you know, um, grab a hold of God and he will heal you in ways that you never would think could happen. And one of my favorite verses is from Joel. It says, the Lord will restore the years that the locusts have eaten. And he yeah. will do that. And so, um, Christine, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share my story over and over and over again. Um, a lot of times the wise come, like, people know this already. They've heard your story a million times, blah, 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 you know, but until the Lord tells me to stop sharing, then that will be the time hey, that I keep will. Keep sharing. I, love to, I want to ask you a quick question uh, really quickly, because this is something that I do hear a lot with people who've had abortions. Mm -hmm. Like, well you know, yeah, I regret it. But if I didn't have that abortion, I wouldn't have my kids today. And how do we respond to something like that? Yeah. Because yes, the children that we have today are obviously very valuable, made in the image of God, all of these things, but then so was this baby. So how, yeah. like, how do you, how, like, what do you say to somebody like that? Well, there's a lie they're believing in that because I used to believe that too. I used to think I regret the abortion, but I'm glad I don't have a child. And then I, as the Lord was like growing me in that, when you understand that that was a unique life, you can't separate it from the other ones that you have. And again, we don't know what the future will. I don't know what my life would have looked like if I would have kept my child. It probably would have been even greater. I'll tell you that. I may not look like, it, I think the Lord would have still done what he needed to do. And, you know, because you can't go wrong with choosing life. I've all the women I've counseled. I've never heard a woman, even in her difficult circumstances, say, I wish I would have had the abortion. I've only heard women who have stories like mine that have said, I wish I could go back and change it. I've never heard of the opposite way. And so that's evidence to me that it is worth it to choose life, even if for some reason at this point you're thinking, I couldn't handle it. Yes, you could. Yeah, you could. Absolutely. So I know you're short on time. Let's tell yes. everybody where they can find you. You mm -hmm. have a book that details your story. If people yes. want to dive into it a little bit more, mm -hmm. where can they find you on social media? All the things before we jump off. Yeah. So I am on Instagram, Tony McFadden 12, I believe. And then uh, Facebook, Tony McFadden. Then my website is TonyMcFadden.com. You can get my book on there or you can get my book on Amazon. And it's and called- that's Tony with an I. Yes. And it's called Redeemed My Journey After Abortion. 
I have it too, and it's somewhere in my house, but since moving, I have boxes still places. I don't even know where they are. So <laughs> I, <get> um, <laughs> I, I, I tried to fish it out for a minute, but I was like, I, I can't find it. I can't find it. <laughs> um, okay. But thank you so much, Tony. I love hey, seeing Rumble. you all the time. Um, yeah. I love talking to you. I'm so glad we got to have you on to share your testimony thank because I think it is such a powerful one. And I know people, um, are going to find healing after this. And then even maybe people who haven't had abortions, they yeah. are gonna have a greater understanding and know how to talk to people. So Amen. thank you for being willing to be vulnerable and share. Thank you. Thank you so much. So good to see you. You too.